This is Ken Briggs, and we're talking about Phoenix. And in particular, we're talking about using the quark methodology, uh, or the quark lepton methodology, in order to identify what particles uh, are associated with what grass. We've already identified the electron, the positron. Um, in fact, I'm going to write them out for you. We've identified that the electron looks like a three looped on a single vertex structure, okay, which is that. You can see it uh, adequately. We've also identified that the W plus looks like two loops and an arrow. The W minus looks like one loop and an arrow, okay, like that. So that the W plus, all of these are single vertex particles but the W plus has the two loops and the W minus has the one loop. And then we've identified that the positron, the anti-electron, has all arrows. Okay. Which is that bottom structure there. Now what we've also said is that when one switches a loop for an arrow, then one is switching literally doing what we call charge conjugation in, in particle physics. So one is taking what was a particle and making it its antiparticle. And so as you see here, where we have the electron that has three loops, we have its antiparticle here, which has three arrows. Where we have a W plus, which has two loops and an arrow, we have a W minus, which has one loop and an arrow. So that in the end, if you were to add together the loops and the arrows. So we take these two particles, the electron and the positron, and put them in the same system. The loops here um, would be a, it would add to a plus three, would cancel out the minus three here, um, and the same thing. So that's where you you do charge conjugation to to identify the particle versus the antiparticle. What I wanted to talk about um, uh, from the last time was this uh, neutrino phenomenon. And the approach that I want to take in describing this, how do we define the neutrino, uh, this, this leptonic structure, given uh, this quark lepton methodology of identifying uh, uh, vertex quantities, is I wanted to point out for you uh, one of the central reactions in particle physics. And the central reaction is that a W minus particle can in point of fact decay into an electron here and an anti-electron neutrino. Now the one thing about particle physics is that when you have a reaction like this you can always take something from one side and move it over to the other side. Now, the way that you do that, if I move the electron here to the other side of the equation, it becomes a positron. If I move the W here to the other side of the equation, it becomes a W plus. And if I move the neutrino here to the other side of the equation, the end, this is an antineutrino, that's what that bar means. But if I move the antineutrino here from this side of the equation to the other side of the equation, it becomes a regular neutrino. And this charge conjugation in the middle of balancing out your, your particle equation is no different than putting a negative. So if you take something, uh, if you take A that's on the left-hand side of your equation, let's just say that you have um, 2 minus 1. So let's say you have, okay, let's do it this way. Let's say that, and this is just to show you the numerical trick that's really going on here. Let's say that you have 3 equals 2 plus 1. All right, we all know that equation. Pretty simple. Now, what happens when I want to move 1 to the other side? Well, in order to do that, I've got to take negative 1 on both sides, right? Negative 1, negative 1, right? I've got to take negative 1 on both sides. And when I do that and add them up, what I get is 2 equals 3. 2, right? That's what happens. So when we're moving, same thing in here, when we're moving these particles to the other side of the equation, we're taking the negative charge, we're taking the negative particle and putting it on the other side. 
That's how you do it in particle uh, reactions. I just wanted to make that clear, that this wasn't, um, how should we call it, a um, uh, poof of smoke and magic here, that there really is uh, re reality going on to um, how I'm, um, uh, what I'm about to do with the particle reaction. So the particle reaction we had was that our W, our uh, weak uh, vector boson, our W minus, is in point of fact equivalent uh, reaction-wise to an electron, uh, or it can become an electron plus an anti-electron neutrino. So what I'm about to show you is I want to take the electron, the anti-electron neutrino over here and make it a positive particle. So I'm going to move it over here, okay, like that. But in order to, to, to move it over there, get the camera to see that, I have to switch it out from being an anti-electron neutrino to being a regular neutrino. So I have W minus plus the regular electron neutrino yields the electron. Okay? And I'm pointing out, or I want to point out, that what's really going on is I'm adding a neutrino to both sides. See that? Now, technically speaking, if I'm actually adding a neutrino to this side, these two things don't cancel out to zero. It doesn't work that way. In particle physics, this plus this ain't zero. It's actually photons. So technically speaking, I really need to add some photonic matter on that side. Okay? We all come to that agreement. Now, now... I would like to take the W minus particle and move it to the other side of the equation, like that. See what I'm trying to do there? Okay. By the way, sometimes I kick in the southern accent as a funny part, but also because I'm in the south right now. I'm actually in Valdosta, Georgia. So this W, I would like to move it from this end to, to this end. In order to do that, I basically have to add its antiparticle, right? See that? And when I do that, this is what happens. I get a photon that's created, and I get what I want, which is my W plus on the other side of the equation. So I know my... My handwriting is a little iffy here, but I think you can understand what I've done. See that bottom part? So now I've got a photon plus a W plus particle plus an electron equaling a neutrino plus a photon. Now, in an optimal case, I can literally ignore the two photons here. I can take that one out and that one out. I'm just going to ignore them. They may not be the same photon, so I might have a problem later on, but for our for our purposes, I want to ignore them and then come and then demonstrate a very, very core, um, a very, excuse me, core uh, particle uh, reaction here. And that is that our neutrino, our electron neutrino, in point of fact, can decay into a W plus and an electron. But this particle reaction should not, in point of fact, be a prohibited particle reaction. Now, it might be extremely rare, but it shouldn't be prohibited in particle physics according to these rules that I've just outlined for basically adding and subtracting and moving things around in a nuclear, uh, rather in a particle process. So that translates, by the way, and so we went through all of this so that I could take you from a form that we do see in the laboratory, that top form there where we have a W minus which, which decays into an electron and an anti-electron neutrino. I'm applying the rules of, of particle, uh, particle equality. Uh, to to um, to get to this particle equation here, where we have uh, a regular, not an anti 
elect, uh, not an anti-electron neutrino, but a regular neutrino on the one side, a regular electron on the other side, and a W+. Plus. So, what does this mean? Now we can take this side of the equation here and translate that into our graphs. Because we know that an electron is simply the three-loop structure, right? And we've demonstrated from a neutron decay, if the neutron decay in Phoenix actually matches the neutron decay that we see in the real world, and it seems to, but it seems to if that other particle, if that other particle in the neutron decay, I'm pulling up a piece of paper here, if that other particle in the neutron decay, namely this, is in point of fact a W minus, right? So this would be a proton, a W minus gives you a neutron. So if the W minus, and I know I seem to be going all over the place here, but really, I'm not. If the W minus um, has an antiparticle, so remember we identified this as the W minus here. Its antiparticle should look like that. It should be just change the arrows for loops and loops for arrows, and you get the, the antiparticle. So we're associating this thing with the W plus, which means that in, in identifying these particles in, in our final, in the equation that we're most interested in, this should look like a vertex that has uh, two loops and one arrow. Okay, so in terms of our graphs, this equation on the left hand, on the uh, the right hand side of this equation, it depends, on this side of the equation, we should have two graph structures that look like that. So we're now asking the question, what does the neutrino look like over here? What is this? And what we find out from the theory, from Phoenix, is that if you put these two particles together here, there is a probability that they will be transformed into a particle that looks like this. It's got two vertices because in this theory vertices are conserved. So if you start off with two vertices, you end up with two vertices. Okay. What's not conserved necessarily are the, uh, the edges and the loops. The two vertices the vertices or the number of vertices is conserved, and on top of it, the total number of arrows and loops is conserved. So when you, if you say that an arrow is a minus one and a loop is a plus one, and you add them all up that way, that quantity is conserved in this theory. In fact, um, we'll, we'll deal with it later on, but it's called the trace of our uh, graph matrix. Okay, But this is what the neutrino looks like. This, this graph here, in point of fact, decays into these two graphs. So we can immediately identify that this must be what we're calling a neutrino. And more interestingly, or just as interestingly, is that if we do the charge conjugation, which is to, to literally uh, take all of the loops and make them into arrows, or vice versa, we know that the anti-electron neutrino basically looks like that structure, except instead of the loops, it has all arrows. Okay, so I have to apologize that my marker is uh, running thin here, but I'll, I'll try to make it uh, very explicitly clear. So that's what the anti-electron neutrino looks like. You can see that. Okay, I know my camera likes to zoom in and out and do all sorts of things, but okay, so that's what the anti-electron neutrino looks like. Um, okay, so when we ask um, questions like the, um, like the neutron decay, I know I'm going into a lot of detail here, but, um, but what I'm trying to point out is that we can use and we have used experiment to determine for us what these graphical things are. And once we've determined what they are, then we ask the next question, does it work in other particle reactions? Do we get this consistently working? Is this electron 
actually functioning as an electron in every reaction that we expect to see an electron in. Does this thing we call a proton actually act like a proton in all of the reactions that we expect to see it in? So we can just come out with some reaction that we've seen in the laboratory, put in the graphs and ask, does that make sense? Does that actually work? Is there a way of getting these things to work together? So that's what we're doing here. This is the, the quark lepton methodology. Because also what we've done here is within this framework, we've not only identified uh, baryons and mesons, but we've also identified leptons. So, and that's one of the, the, the reasons for me doing this uh, here, is to demonstrate not only do we talk about the electron, the positron, the W plus, and the W minus, which are in point of fact um, uh, leptonic matter, um, or uh, force matter that only is associated with leptonic matter. But we can also answer the question about what are neutrinos, because now we've been able to derive what a neutrino is and how it looks like as, what it looks like as a graph, and then to derive what its antiparticle is on top of it. So once we have these core things in place that seem to follow the same kinds of rules that we expect from... Um, from uh, um, our uh, QED, quantum electrodynamics, and QCD, quantum chromodynamics, um, you know, have we been able to then uh, um, account for all of the particles that we observe in nature and also, just as importantly, all of their particle reactions? And uh, from this basic little uh, um, demonstration, the answer is yes. Now. What I do want to point out um, in the next video is the core uh, mathematical concept going on here. Um, that, you know, this is not something that I'm pulling out of my, my, um, my uh, beautiful you-know-what, but it's something that um, we can actually demonstrate uh, mathematically. Um, so I'm going to stop this, and now we're going to take on the, the actual uh, math behind um, Phoenix, the core math, okay. <laughs>